Welcome to the Proposition 1 Telewebinar Town Hall featuring King County Council Member and Vice Chair Jane Haig and Representative Cyrus Habib. For those who, you are, who are watching or listening to this event, this is how it will work. If you're watching on YouTube, you can also attend by telephone and you can call the following number, 425-739-8154. That's 425-739-8154. If you are calling via telephone, you can also watch on your computer on YouTube, and it's a long, uh, long web address, but it's http colon slash slash bit dot ly slash lwit live event. That's http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash lwit live event. Those of you who are on YouTube will be able to type questions and send them to us and we will respond. We will be alternating between taking phone calls and web questions. And now here are our panelists. Good evening, I'm Jane Haig, uh, King County Council member, and I am delighted that you're here with us on our webinar uh, dealing with Prop 1, a voter-approved uh, measure that will be before you on April 22nd. And I'm Representative Cyrus Habib. I um, represent the 48th Legislative District, which is, I think, almost entirely uh, inscribed within Council Member Haig's 6th Council District. And uh, I'm also very excited and happy to be here uh, with her to talk to you about this very, very important uh, proposition that's before you and to take your questions. I think this is one of the few times that we've had an opportunity to have uh, somebody from the state legislature as well as the King County Council to talk about uh, this ballot measure that will be submitted uh, for your approval on April 22nd. So we have uh, many opportunities to look at that uh, issue from different perspectives. So I'm going to uh, begin by uh, discussing a little bit of the background and how we got here. And um, as you all know, we fund our transportation system in this state uh, through a number of different funding mechanisms. And uh, the primary one for large projects, such as the 520 bridge replacement or our freeways, is the gas tax. And uh, there have been a number of proposals in the state legislature over the last two years uh, dealing with the next generation of transportation investments for Washington State. And these are, uh, some of these are, are finishing what we've already begun, like the 520 replacement bridge. Uh, some of them are critical investments uh, in our, uh, for example, our north-south corridor in eastern Washington, or our uh, 167-509 corridor that serves um, Pierce County and the Port of Tacoma. Uh, th those competing packages uh, were uh, ultimately did not result in a compromise transportation revenue package passed by the legislature. At the same time as those discussions were going on, a critical funding source for King County Metro, our local um, bus rapid transit system, uh, was also expiring. Uh, so part of the discussion in Olympia was around you know, finding transportation solutions that work for each part of our very, very diverse state. As you know, in King County, buses do play a very important role. King County Metro plays an important role. And so we included in, in the transportation package that was debated in the House um, a local option for King County to raise the necessary revenue to pay for, uh, to, to fill the gap in King County Metro funding so you would not see an interruption in your service levels. Um, and since that package ultimately didn't pass, no package actually passed both chambers. Uh, we do not uh, have that local option here in King County. And so uh, King County Executive Dow Constantine and the entire King County Council uh, voted, uh, you know, again, across an entire uh, political spectrum of, I of, of ideology and philosophy, voted unanimously um, to use existing uh, taxing authority to uh, make sure that your service levels are not interrupted on King County Metro, but it requires voter approval. Um, and in addition, when they did that, they also said, well, you know, our county is also diverse. Um, so just like the state is, the county has different needs. Some 
jurisdictions within our county really need to focus more on road repair for safety. And so this actually allocates money both for local use for roads and road repair as well as to keep King County Metro going at the same level of quality and service that you've seen. And so that's kind of the background of where we are. Um, it is mightily important that we not uh, further cut King County Metro if we want to make sure that folks can get to and from work, that congestion does not increase, and the most vulnerable in our society are able to get to the doctor's office or to a social service center or to school or to a college like Lake Washington Institute of Technology where we are right now. So that's why, um, in broad uh, view of why I support this proposal and um, I turn it over to Council Vice Chair Haig. Thank you so much, Representative Habib, and I appreciate your being here with me tonight. Um, April 22nd will be the opportunity to decide whether or not the reductions in service that were made part of the 2014 King County budget can be reinstated. Um, we're looking at 600,000 hours of reduction in Metro's countywide service. And we're also looking at an opportunity to fund uh, city and county road projects. So the package that voters will be deciding upon uh, deals with a tenth of a cent sales tax and $60 of a vehicle licensing fee. And together those two funding sources, which were authorized by the state legislature, raise about $135 million per year. Of the $135 million per year, 60% will go to transit and 40% will go to roads. And the roads money will be shared with each city on a population basis. The package also includes a low income fare and it also includes a sunset clause for both taxing sources in 10 years. And finally, it allows opportunities to swap out these taxes if different tools are given to us by the state legislature and the governor in a package yet to be enacted. And I just wanted to say that, like all of us, we wanted to have a roads and transit package that was statewide. And King County was a major player in making sure that our voice was heard and collaborating with the legislature to see whether or not that could occur. It will occur sometime, but we had issues to deal with on our home turf that were very pressing. <clears throat> As Representative Habib mentioned, all nine of us uh, voted yes on the King County Council in support of the proposition sent by Executive, Constant Executive Constantine because we feel that we have a fiduciary responsibility to protect our transportation infrastructure. King County has 50% of the state's economy, 40% of the jobs, and 30% of the population. And that is a formula that cannot degrade with lack of access to transportation. Plan B is not perfect. It does not increase service. It does not fully fund roads. It does not recognize growing transit communities on the east side and the south end that do have productive do, do not have productive routes uh, that compare to the ridership of Seattle. But it is putting a system in place that people can continue to rely on. So we look forward to your questions and are happy to answer them. Do we have the contact info yeah, for folks? Contact info again. You may call 425-739-8154. And if you want to log on to YouTube, it's http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly forward slash lwit live event. So, Representative yeah. Habib, um, I'm sure that you, like me, have had a lot of comments about uh, if this Prop 1 passes on April 22nd, that somehow they may, that may jeopardize a statewide transportation package and that we're better off to have waited for a statewide transportation package. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, and, and that's a, I'm glad you asked that because, um, you know, many of my friends uh, who genuinely... Uh, 
believe and support King County Metro and would otherwise support this proposal, there are uh, there are some voices uh, who disagree with us, and the reason they disagree with us is not because they they I, I believe is not because they disagree with um, the policy here, but is because they believe, um, as as Councilmember Haig mentioned, uh, that there that there could be a political price to pay, and that strategically it makes sense not to do this, and and that's not. Um, from serving on the state trans the House Transportation Committee in the legislature for the past two years, and working very closely with my neighbor to the south, Representative Cliburn, who chairs that committee, um, I do not believe that that is the case. And the reason why I don't believe that's the case is that, um, you know, l let's take the let's take the uh, the counterfactual. So if we were to fail to pass uh, th this uh, Prop One on Tuesday. Uh, what that would do is, uh, since it is clear that 60% of the votes to, su to, to, to sustain a referendum vote on a transportation package would need to come from King County. So in other words, let's say you had uh, a transportation revenue package passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, and if there were a referendum attempt to repeal that, perhaps by Mr. Eyman or, or by someone else, uh, then 60% of the votes to sustain the act of the legislature would likely need to come from King County. That's been our experience in the past. And if we are unable to get to 50.1 uh, on a measure uh, such as this one that, that solely serves us, uh, then it, it sends a very negative message about our ability to get over 60% to support a statewide package which will uh, you know, involve lots of infrastructure in other parts of the state that we may not see here in King County. They're still very important, um, but I think that the, 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 pull, the opposite could far more easily be said, that failure to do this actually sets the stage for further failure and delay with a statewide revenue package. Um, the other issue is that, as Council Member Haig mentioned, uh, the, the language of this proposal, this proposition, allows us uh, the, the county council to change uh, the uh, funding source that that backfills this metro shortfall. So, if the legislature were to pass a transportation transportation revenue package that allowed for um, uh, for King County to repeal this uh, sales tax hike and this license fee tab a tab fee. Uh, but replace it with another funding source like a motor vehicle excise tax or some other funding mechanism, um, then then that could happen. So it would it, there still are uh, options that King County would of course negotiate for. The other thing is that 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 position that this somehow undermines a revenue package also presupposes that there's no other value to King County in a statewide package, and that's just not true. It's not true directly because um, we will make sure that fully funding 520 is part of the conversation. And that's a huge value for our constituents to make sure we connect Microsoft and Seattle and Amazon and Bellevue. Um, we also, uh, in, in both packages, had hundreds of millions of dollars in 405 expansion. Um, and so all of those things will be uh, items that King County voters are going to find very, very attractive, I think, to improve their quality of life, to improve their commute times. Um, and, and the business community, I'm confident, labor in King County will also make sure that King County votes uh, in a strong way because our port of Seattle is so dependent on statewide transportation infrastructure connecting to eastern Washington and, and down south to, to Californian markets. So I, I think it's going to uh, absolutely, uh, these two will work hand in hand. We first need to rescue the most vulnerable and keep our streets clear, and then we need to move forward on a statewide strategic package. We're also joined this evening uh, with a technical expert, uh, Mr. John Risha. And uh, Mr. Risha, there have uh, been uh, reports that we received at the King County Council that sales tax increases uh, have probably affected the amount of revenue that Metro will receive over the next number of years. Would you like to comment on the fact um, that we are seeing an increase in revenue and what that will do to the potential uh, changes in revenue in terms of the bus service and the routes that are 
propose for reduction or elimination? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, and thank you, Representative Habib. Um, as we have begun to see, uh, I'll start off by saying sales tax is a primary source for funding King County Metro. Um, in fact, it represents about half of all the revenue that funds the transit system. And sales tax goes up and down with the economy. In, recent, in the recent recession, we actually saw a significant drop in our sales tax, which prompted many of the financial challenges we've been facing as, as a county um, and as a tra transit agency. We've started to see some uh, rebound of our economy, and our most recent forecast, which just came out in the middle of March, um, shows that is telling us that it looks like we'll probably be receiving about $30 million more than was anticipated two years ago. So it looks like the economy is rebounding, but what does that mean in terms of the transit service? It doesn't solve the long-term problem. There's actually a very significant gap in serving the, the transit that's being delivered. It means that instead of a 600,000 hour cut, we're probably looking at about 550,000 hours. And that means instead of 74 routes being cut, it's probably only 72 routes being cut. And there's instead of 104 that are going to be changed or reduced, it's maybe more like 88 or so. It doesn't mean we're out of the woods, but it tells us that based on our productivity basis and the formula for how we calculate service is reduced or grown, we actually save some of that more productive service that was down at the bottom of the list. Um, it will be, of course, dependent upon what the executive transmits over um, and if Proposition 1 does pass, the executive has been very clear that there would be no reason to transmit any reduction. Um, so, hope that answers your question. Right. Well, we have one person on the line, I'm sorry, on the telephone line. Would you like to ask a question at this time? And then we have four people on line with questions. So we'll start with the question we have on line. And the question is from Kristen, and she asks, why does this measure have money for both roads and buses? Why can't we just pay for buses? It's very clear that this measure, Proposition 1, is to protect our transportation infrastructure. And certainly buses are infrastructure, but so are roads. And in our rural section of King County, we actually have paved roads that are going to be going to gravel because of lack of revenue. One of the major issues that each city shares is how can we take care of our growing transportation needs with not enough arterial capacity and not enough street opportunities. Uh, they're also looking for sidewalks and bike paths. So each city uh, will receive a fair share, 40% based on population, of the revenue that comes in from Prop 1 should it pass. And it will be up to those city councils, those governing bodies, to decide how best to use their dollars for um, infrastructure, for, for roads. So this package is a roads and transit. It's a comprehensive local package for King County, and um, it addresses maintaining the infrastructure that we now have. And I think it's, um, I, I think it's very important. Um, you know, we don't always think about it this way, but there are, I believe, 13 states uh, in the union with smaller populations than King County. This is a big county. Um, you know, we're talking over 2 million people, geographically very large, very diverse uh, in, in any number of ways, uh, but uh, the needs that exist, um, you know, in, in, in Woodenville and Maple Valley and Capitol Hill, uh, and uh, in downtown Bellevue and Mercer Island are all very, very different uh, because as we try to uh, manage an economy um, and a workforce and a population as large as King County has, uh, we do need to have diverse tools. And so I actually think one of the strengths of this uh, proposition is that um, it is very reflective of and responsive to uh, the needs of a county uh, that is so large. Jason Online asks, will Metro really cut the stop at Bellevue College? Yes. <laughs> and it's not only Bellevue College. 
we're here at Lake Washington Technical College. And we also, in King County, have Cascadia and UW Bothell, in addition to our own University of Washington. Uh, the four institutions that I first mentioned all will have serious reductions in service. Um, it's a concern to me and I think to Representative Habib and our technical folks uh, that at an age when we're looking at getting a workforce that's trained for technology and the jobs that are so vibrant here in King County, that these people have an opportunity to receive the education that provides them upward mobility. So that is a big concern to me. I think uh, uh, Representative Habib can also speak to this, but this is uh, one of the major reasons why I am supporting Prop 1, because we need to connect students with colleges and colleges with jobs. You know, when you look at, um, w when you look at, so the way that people talk about economic development these days is in terms of clusters. You've probably heard that term used. And, you know, a cluster is, is exactly what Councilmember Haig's describing. Um, employers and higher education and, um, and commercial, residential, all uh, surrounding a focus on one or more industry. And, um, you know, I happened to go to college and uh, graduate school and law school at a time when, you know, it was, af it was during and after the dot-com bust. And so uh, when, you know, Richard Florida talks about the creative class, I went to school with a lot of the folks in the, quote, creative class, the folks that want to work at Microsoft, want to work at Amazon, want to work at Google. And we've got a lot of them growing up right here. Um, in the areas that we represent, in particular Bellevue and Kirkland and Redmond, you've got them growing up here, you've got them moving here to work, and, you know, transit is a critical, critical, uh, it's, I wouldn't even say it's an amenity, it's a necessity for the creative class. Uh, when you look at the Bay Area, when you look at New York City, when you look at Boston, when you look at, uh, you know, these are areas that are able and they're attractive and they attract talented people because they have many different types of transit options. Um, and what's more, um, you know, as was mentioned, to educate young people and, and uh, all people for the jobs of, and re to retool uh, for the jobs of the 21st century, they need to be, folks need to be able to get to and from school. You know, right here at Lake Washington Institute of Technology, you might be a part-time student, then you go, might go and work. Uh, and then you may uh, also go and take care of your family. Well, how are you going to get to and from all these places if, A, your routes are cut, and B, there's now so much excess traffic on 405. I mean, you know, it, al <laughs> it already took me over half an hour to get four exits on, on 405, and that's before these cuts. So we just can't have that if we want to have the teeming, vibrant economy that, that the Puget Sound region uh, can and should and deserves to have. Of those on the phone, does anybody on the phone have a question? Okay, we'll go back to another online question from Mark. Mark says, I missed the beginning. Could you briefly explain why we need Prop 1 again? Why do we need to vote to make sure we have transit or road improvements? Why doesn't the state pay for this? So, um, the one of the things uh, that I actually like about how we do transportation is um, that because we're a diverse state, each region has its own needs. I actually prefer um, that King County make decisions about Metro itself. I, I uh, would rather, I know that Council Member Haig is much closer to me as her constituent um, when it comes to making decisions about Metro and, and overseeing this large system. Uh, and then we also have a regional transit system, which is uh, sound transit. But um, so the state doesn't get involved uh, with the operations of, of bus rapid transit or light rail. Um, because if, if you think about it, uh, a, a vast majority of legislators don't represent regions that are served by those services. And I don't really think someone in Walla Walla needs to be making service decisions about bus stops in Bellevue. Um, I think we should do that here. Uh, and so that's why we have local taxing authority to make decisions like that on a local basis. And that's kind of how we've done things in the state. And uh, as long as 
the county continues to have the tools it needs to move forward, I think it works. And uh, so to be more specific about the caller's uh, question, what does Prop 1 do for us? It um, adds a tenth of a cent sales tax and $60 of vehicle licensing fee. It allows for a reduced income fare and it allows for sunsetting both taxes uh, within 10 years. It allows for a swap out if the state legislature gives us different tools. And it um, prevents, uh, it, it restates uh, service hours of 600,000 that have already been cut, in, 600,000 hours that have already been cut in our 2014 uh, King County budget. Um, it's not a perfect measure, but it does forestall the uh, degrading of infrastructure that is so important to our economy. And again, to restate, King County has 50% of the state's economy, 40% of the jobs, and 30% of the population. Clearly a driver that cannot afford to, uh, to degrade. Okay, online Priya has a question. She says, Hi, I live in Redmond and I will probably support Prop 1, but I see some empty buses and I wonder why Metro cannot cut these buses. Priya, that is a question that we hear all the time. So why should we support uh, additional fees for a transit system that has buses rattling around in the neighborhoods empty most of the time? And we would liken that to you're going to, uh, to shop at Costco. And you start off with an empty cart and you travel the aisles and you pick up the products that you need. You go to the cash register, you check out, you take the cart to your car or, or bus or wherever, and your cart is empty again. So a productive route is not necessarily full all the time but it does support a route that does get people to jobs and services. It also connects neighborhoods with uh, metropolitan areas in their city and um, in the region, and not everybody in a neighborhood is going to be taking a bus uh, at, all, at all times. And maybe our technical uh, supporter, Mr. Risha, would like to further comment on that. Um, actually, your description was, uh, was excellent. One of the things that Metro has been focused on, uh, especially in the last few years, is the productivity of its service. And in fact, what we have seen through a number of efficiencies in how Metro plans and delivers its service is that their productivity has improved by almost 3% a year for the last couple of years. So we've seen more people per bus trip and more people per passenger mile on those buses because of how we're planning and delivering that service. So the efforts of the County Council and the Executive working together have really started to change how many empty buses people see and that they're, the service itself is much more productive. Mark writes, thanks for the answer, Council Member Haig. I live in Bellevue but work in downtown Seattle, so I am, a, I am watching this right now while, I, while I'm waiting for my bus home. Mm -hmm. Great. Fantastic. And, and I hope that that bus will be there a few months from now. And I hope it's a covered station, a covered stop. Lynn asks, what can Bellevue voters hope to achieve by voting for Proposition 1? What will the benefits be for Bellevue residents beyond Metro bus service? That's an excellent question and um, it's been really gratifying to me because I represent the Greater East Side uh, to see over the past few years the engagement of all of the East Side in wanting to support Metro and take the bus and recognizing that it is an alternative to getting into uh, a car. So certainly we, we don't have the productive routes that Bellevue has, but we do have uh, an interested community that wants to have ridership. We've also seen increasing density. And Bellevue now is the second largest city in the county and a major economic hub. Uh, we have Bellevue College, we have uh, Lake Washington Technical College, we have Cascadia, we have UW Bothell. And those educational institutions 
fuel the jobs that are growing on the east side. And we need to make sure that a workforce, a properly educated workforce is available to keep those uh, economies going. Uh, in addition, I believe that transit provides uh, other opportunities that um, make sure that we've got a healthy environment and, an, and uh, an engaging lifestyle. And livability is a very important part of communities these days. And having a, a livable community that can walk, can take transit, that has a, a wide array of, of transportation options is a huge draw for uh, individuals to live and work in an area. You know, I lived in downtown Bellevue for uh, for three years uh, after law school, and I think that um, I, I believe we have now around 12,000 residents in the downtown Bellevue neighborhood, and it's the largest neighborhood by um, in terms of re residential population. And it's stunning when you think about it. It's actually geographically not a very large area to have over 10,000, I think nearly 12,000 people living there. And, um, you know, these are... Uh, uh, folks who, uh, uh, one of the reasons why they enjoy living there is the, is the tr downtown Bellevue Transit Center and the connection, whether they're headed to downtown Seattle, uh, whether they're headed to the, to the U District, um, you know, whether they're headed over to Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a, it, for a lot of people, um, our commercial and residential and, um, and office uh, spaces are connected quite effectively by Metro. It allows a lifestyle that will be very, actually, I think Bellevue's already seen the benefits of it when you look at the density and the, the commercial activity in downtown Bellevue. And of course, we're going to see even more of that in Bellevue uh, when the Spring District development uh, really takes hold in the Bell Red Corridor. But, um, you know, I think, Lynn, that the other thing is uh, I urge you, in addition to the, uh, the op ed that Councilmember. Haig and I have written in the, the East Side Reporters. The Bellevue Reporter itself endorsed Prop 1 and um, the editorial board. And so I also suggest that our, our Bellevue based and, and other uh, viewers also take a look at that, um, that reporter uh, endorsement. Okay, Lynn, as a quick follow up, then we have someone on the phone, and then we'll go back to uh, Liz. Lynn asks, or follow up is Will we be getting more money for some of our road projects? Yes, you will. Um, a big portion of the 40% does go to Bellevue. And uh, the city council in Bellevue is focusing, I believe, on arterials. And we have a number of projects that um, can be leveraged with the money that would come from Prop 1, including 124th Avenue Northeast and other uh, arterials that would support the Spring District. So there are roads money as well as transit uh, dollars that will be very important to the east side. I believe we, have, we might have a message from one of the callers. Okay, we'll go back to a question now from Liz. What will happen if we vote no? I heard that you have more money now than you've ever had. That's a very good question, and there has been a lot of talk about the fact that voters in Pierce and Snohomish County said no to their transit packages, and routes are being reformed and added uh, as sales taxes increased in both of those counties. We have seen uh, a potential increase in, in uh, sales tax revenue, and uh, we received a report on what that increase means for a Metro Prop 1. And it means that instead of a 600,000 hour cut, we're looking at about a 550,000 hour uh, uh, cut in service. And that means that instead of 74 hour, uh, bus routes that are reduced, we'll see 72. And instead of 104 uh, bus routes, reduced, we'll see 88. Excuse me, the 74 was eliminated and it moves to 72 eliminated. The 104 were the routes that were a potential reduction and they're now to 88. So clearly a, an increase in sales tax does not make up uh, for the fact that we have such a large deficit. John, did you want to say anything else? If you don't mind me adding to this, um, from a transit perspective, um, over the last decade, a little bit more than a decade, 
the transit agency, while it has had some reductions, um, in fact, did some uh, trimming of less productive routes, transit service is actually delivering almost a half a million hours more than it was uh, more than a decade ago. We are just now getting to the same revenue level, level that we were at in 2005. And we're still over a hundred million dollars less than what was anticipated, even with the new forecast, more than a hundred million dollars less than was anticipated uh, with the Transit Now for, uh, service uh, vote of the people. So what we're delivering now is much of the service that was planned for in Transit Now, but without the revenue. And so this, it may be more revenue than Metro's ever seen, but it's still not what was anticipated. And so Metro's efficiencies and trimming of its structure has actually been able to make it deliver more within the dollars that are available. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, King County is, uh, is, has been quite economically, continues to be economically competitive and is growing and is going to grow over the next 10 years before this proposition sunsets. And the growth that we're going to see, a lot of it's going to be on the east side. Um, a lot of the, the economic activity and the job growth is going to be on the east side, but it's going to be all throughout our county. Um, and, you know, as that happens, it's important that we think intentionally and, um, and I, I would say creatively and courageously about how we're going to accommodate that growth. Because growth is wonderful, and it's great to have increased economic activity, and, you know, we can all make a little more money, and, um, you know, but at the same time, um, when when that leads to, to uh, congestion on our streets and our quality of life eroding, um, you know, you reach a bottleneck point. And I'll tell you that with transit, um, it's interesting. I've read studies on how transit works, uh, the behavioral decision to take a bus versus driving to work for people who do have the option to do both, and many obviously don't. Um, but for people who do, it's remarkable if you take um, – in a 15-minute interval on a bus coming to a certain bus stop, um, and you and then you prolong it to a 30-minute interval, there's a certain drop-off. And then if you extend it from 30 to 45 or 30 to 60, there's like this massive drop-off. Because people cannot plan around, people have jobs with typically pretty fixed hours. Um, they have kids and responsibilities, so on. Class starts at a certain time. So... You, you start seeing as you thin out your service levels through reductions, not only are you seeing kind of the, the – it's not a linear equation where you just see more people, you know, t finding other ways to get to and from where they're going. It actually has a much steeper curve because behavior – because there's tipping points in behavioral, uh, in behavioral change where people say, you know what? God, I can't, I'm just not going to wait 45, I don't, you know, I'm not going to, it doesn't fit with my schedule to get to work 45 minutes early because that was the only bus that exists. Um, so, so I think those are all things to think about uh, as, as possible repercussions if we see these types of cuts uh, just at a time when our county uh, and our region is recovering and actually pressing forward and, and, and improving economically. Okay, Jason is asking, why are we asking car drivers to pay for buses? Why can't we just raise fares? And that's a very good question too, uh, Jason. We have raised fares. And over the past number of years, we've gone from what we call a fare box return uh, of 18% to right now pretty close to 30%. And that 30% is one of the highest fare box returns that any other transit agency in the country has. So we're very proud that uh, riders pay and um, buses are also taking cars off the road. So there is some synergy there between the two. And Mr. Reischer, did you want to add anything else technically? Um, I would chime in that uh, there have been four fare increases in the past five years implemented, plus a fifth fare increase approved that will go into effect in March, which will effectively double transit fares in a six-year period of time. Uh, and so there has been a very significant effort. Uh, with relationship to the question of where do we actually rank nationally, of the top 30 transit agencies in the nation, we're currently 13th in fare box recovery. 
and remembering that as we transit geeks look at that, we also realize that many of those agencies also have heavier focus on rail, and some of the, the old, those older systems have less labor, and so they have a little bit higher fare box recovery just because of that. You know, and, and but to, and and so the, as you can tell, my colleagues from the county have so much data. You know, this is uh, why you can trust their unanimous vote on the King County Council. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, the question I think uh, Jason's question also got it. You know, I, there's a, and maybe I'm just hearing it, but a tone of, you know, isn't it unfair um, that someone who's not taking the bus should have to um, subsidize someone who is taking the bus? Or why don't we have it just be a user fee? And um, I guess my response would be, I think that the, the value um, really does go to drivers as well. Uh, we, we need to get around in this county in a time span and a commute time that is reasonable and manageable and doesn't make us go crazy in the car. Uh, I'm a big fan of audiobooks, but uh, there's, you know, there's a limit. You want to get uh, to and from home uh, and work to, it, as quickly as you can to spend time with your families. And so there's a lot of ways we can, we can reduce that commute time and the frustration associated with it and the unhappiness and the time away from family. We can uh, continue to build capacity on 405 and, and complete 520, which are uh, things that I think both of us are big champions for. But that's not going to get you all the way there when we have the kind of population growth that we're seeing. And that population growth is good. It means Microsoft's doing well. It means Boeing's going to build its 777X here in the Puget Sound region. It means that Google is growing its footprint right here in Kirkland. Um, but it also means that we've got to find a lot of ways to keep your congestion time and your quality of life uh, at pace. And so um, supporting a transit center that moves lots of people at very critical times of day in an efficient way is actually what every major metropolis has decided makes sense to keep us all sane and happy. And so to that extent, there is value for everyone on the road. If you put an extra lane worth of I-90 traffic on the freeway because we have to make service cuts on Metro, um, all you know, drivers are going to be as unhappy as any bus rider. May I put a number and a quantity Please. to, okay. to oh, that? Okay, thank you. Um, Data. <laughs> the, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, if the uh, metro cuts and reductions go into effect, we estimate that between 20 and 30,000 cars will be added to the roadway each day. Most of those, the majority of which will be during the peak periods. So when you're commuting uh, in the morning and the evening, those trips will actually have a very heavy impact. So we will see more cars on an already impacted system. And you would then be looking at the question of what are the costs of building roadways uh, to try and accommodate that or the lost productivity associated with it. And, and building roadways would again, by the way, you know, go back to uh, a gas tax. So it's, it's, not like the, it's not like the alternative is without a cost to drivers either. Um, this is, is a quite effective piece of that mix. But I think it's a very important question. It's one that um, I, I've heard um, a lot. And, you know, I, I think, it, you know, I, I'm not going to speak for you, but I, I think it's fair to say both Council Member Haig and I um, take this sort of thing very seriously when it comes to um, raising any type of a fee or a tax or anything like that on our constituents. Um, it's not something that uh, that, that any of us ever does lightly because, well, for one thing, we hear from you. Uh, but it's it, it has a cost on people's pocketbooks, and there's no doubt about that. And so, um, you know, I think that I think of us both as individuals who are thoughtful in in asking you uh, to to chip in to make our region uh, all that it can be for the coming ten years and beyond, and to make sure that we don't go the opposite direction and, and erode instead. And I would like to just add uh, to Representative Habib's comments about not raising taxes lightly. Uh, I think both of us would agree that, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but we aren't going to ask you, the voters, to pay more for a service or uh, a, a, a piece of infrastructure without knowing that we have tightened our belts and we have brought as much reform as possible. And it's worth mentioning that over the past three or four years, Metro received an outside audit that cited 
about a hundred things that could be done more efficiently uh, to tighten its belt and to provide better service. Uh, to date, almost all of those points have been implemented and we have a much more efficient, a less bloated, and a more transparent transit service here in King County because of those steps that have been taken uh, to take a look at the service that we deliver for you and the cost that it costs. Kristen writes, I'm worried Prop 1 will fail. Is there really no way that King County can find the money to prevent these bus cuts? No. And, and in fact, we're actually, uh, I would say we're actually quite lucky that this, 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 this uh, uh, benefit district uh, authority exists. When I first got to the legislature and we began this discussion around transportation investments statewide as well as local options for King County, I was not aware of it. And I think a lot of other legislators were not aware of it. It really came probably from someone like Mr. Risha, but, but really it came from the county executive and the county council saying, okay, well, we do need a plan B um, because the, the politics of this in Olympia were you know, quite challenging uh, for a whole host of reasons. And so um, I was actually, though, you know, again, I think we'd love to see a more comprehensive solution, but I'm relieved, Kristen, that we were um, able to find this uh, authority to come to the voters and really ask the voters to participate in this decision. And I didn't want to just say no, uh, but perhaps Mr. Risha would like to give some background on how we have used uh, the reductions and the efficiencies that we found in Metro over the past few years to put more bus service on the street. So we have really exhausted uh, the potential that we have locally without increased revenues. So uh, John. Let me set a little bit of context. Over the past few years, transit agencies around the nation were facing the same problem that we're facing here in Washington. Our neighbors just to the north and just to the south, Community Transit and Pierce Transit, both looked at their, the same challenges we were facing here in King County, and they cut service, dramatically cut service. In fact, 35 to 37 percent of all of their service was eliminated. Instead of cutting service, King County went back and used a performance audit and a strong look at its overall finances to use all of its rainy day reserves, make sure it didn't have any extra money tucked into any other reserves that could be used. So used all of the one-time money it could. Realigned how it delivers service and from an efficiency standpoint and really got more effective at how we deliver service. The King County employees of Metro Forgo, for, forgot that, forgo, forwent, a, <laughs> forwent a um, cost of living increase. They actually gave up uh, a salary increase that was already uh, due to them. And those kinds of changes really brought some great effectiveness. Metro isn't done. They're continuing to work on their efficiency. In fact, they're using Lean right now to look at their vehicle maintenance work to make sure that they've got... Um, just the right amount of parts and service to, do, to take care of the 1,300 plus uh, vehicles that we have in our fleet. But what does that mean? Well, over the past five years, Metro has been able to save more than $800 million uh, worth of transit service. And those F efforts are also netting $148 million worth of transit service each year in ongoing savings. So all of those changes that they've done have been really, really valuable. At the end of that $1.4 billion problem that we've been facing is this small hole of $75 million a year or 600,000 hours of transit service. And that's what's left. And there isn't anything else to cut. But they're going to keep looking at efficiencies and effectiveness and see what else can be continue to be done. Mark says, I'm hopping on my bus now. Thanks so much for this info. I will be voting yes when I get home. Thank you, Thank Mark. You. Uh, one question was, um, what is the cost of, a met of Metro bus drivers to the system, and are they paid a higher amount than in the other systems? That is a very good question, and it's one that we hear uh, a lot about. 
Our Metro bus drivers um, get about $63,000 a year. With overtime, many drivers are getting $100,000. Uh, because Metro drivers have a long tenure, many of them are at the top of their pay scale. But uh, we also have a higher part-time percentage of drivers that earn $26,000. The percentage of part-time drivers that we have at the metro system is one of the highest percentages of any of the other transit systems in the United States. Um, and it should be brought out that the average uh, salary uh, in King County is about the same as a metro bus driver without overtime. Anything to add? Um, just that that percentage of part-time drivers is about 40% of all of our drivers are part-time drivers. Um, and their benefits package is slightly different. Um, it's actually scaled to the to the size of their uh, part time, and there's so there's two classes of benefits within Metro, and so it's a real balanced approach. But because of that part time service, Metro may be at the higher end on a national scale from from the salary wise, but. By using their drivers more productively, they actually are able to employ fewer to get to deliver the greater service. Good point. Okay, Liz asks, you both are asking us to vote yes, right? Is there a lot of people asking us to vote no, too? Um, it would appear that there is a very active pro and con campaign, judging by the yard signs that I've seen throughout the county. Um, so I think that there are alternatives out there, and I'm sure as a, an informed voter that you're looking at both sides. You know, and I also think, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, this is a serious question. It's a serious proposition. It's uh, This is not um, symbolic. It really, it has financial consequences on both sides. And so I think that, uh, Liz, um, the outreach that, that we're trying to do both here and in the reporters and on social media is, is I think it's our job. Um, whenever we, you know, we just endorse a campaign or we send something to the voters, um, you know, it's, it's really our job to tell you why we're asking this and to demonstrate to you that it makes sense because, you know, the people in, 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 in our districts and I believe throughout this county, you all are smart. Right? You're, you're going to make your own informed decision, but we can give you the information. That's why we brought a technical expert, because we know you can analyze the, the, the information that we're giving you and make your decision. So, um, you know, I think that uh, the list of organizations and individuals that have supported this is vast and bipartisan, um, and I think dwarfs the, the, the no campaign. Um, but that being said, even even if there were no if there were no no campaign, I still think it would be incumbent upon us to show up here and to speak to our neighbors and constituents and friends and and uh, and acquaintances and let them know why we've made the decisions we've made at the county and state level, how we've gotten here, and the path we see going forward. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Uh, anyone on the telephone have any questions? Okay, the next question is. How will this ballot measure impact a statewide transportation package, and do you support that? Um, so, uh, so going back to what I was saying earlier, I think that uh, for us to have a so l let me let me answer it a little bit differently than I did last time for those who who were listening, and, and I'll, I'll get to the answer. But um, you know, I think for us to get a state transportation revenue package. Um, a few things are going to have to come together. One is uh, both the House and the Senate are going to have to demonstrate that they actually have the votes to pass a gas tax package. Um, that was difficult this year because it's an election year and the conventional wisdom is it's more difficult to get people to take a vote like that. Um, even if it's supported by business and labor, still difficult to do in an election year. Uh, it's also a shorter legislative session, so it's, again, harder to get uh, big things done. Um, but I think we need to, A, get, de demonstrate that we've got the votes to pass it in the House and the Senate um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the revenue side. On the spending side uh, of a package, I think, you know, for many of us, 
completing 520, finishing what we started, and not leaving this a bridge to nowhere is absolutely essential. And I, I know that what, what, what I'm happy about is, and Councilmember Haig will probably, because she's been a part of this uh, struggle for quite some time, at finally we have agreement from east side legislators and Seattle legislators that we need to get this thing done. And that wasn't always the case. And so the fact that we have a, a unanimous voice on that. So that's one. Um, there's other little uh, smaller kind of expenditure issues around where, you know, what the, what, what the money is spent on. But then the final thing is there's disagreement about a handful of reform policies. And um, we can have a separate town hall to talk about those. Um, I, I will be having more legislative town halls to discuss transportation as well as other issues. But some of those reform policies are more controversial than others. I'm confident that a compromise revenue package will include some series of reforms, uh, just as King County has brought reform to its system. So stay tuned for that. I do not think um, that voting for Prop 1 or passage of Prop 1 will in any way uh, uh, for forestall a transportation revenue package. In fact, I think it sends a strong signal that we in King County are very invested in improving roads and infrastructure at the local level as well as moving people through innovative uh, transit and effective transit for the 21st century. And I think that message needs to be heard from, you know, in Olympia so that uh, legislators will know that we will defend this if need be in a referendum battle and that they can feel comfortable taking a vote uh, on behalf of their constituents. Yeah, our caller is now logged in. His name is Bo and he says, sorry I was on the phone but you couldn't hear me. I'm with the Transit Riders Union and I'm definitely supporting Prop 1 but I'm wondering why do we have to use this tax? The sales tax and a flat fee. Why can't you use something more progressive? And as a follow-up, will you keep fighting to get a more progressive tax authority for us? Thank you very much, Bo, and it's great that you can connect with us. Uh, we are using the tools that the state legislature has given us as local options. Uh, the county cannot act independently and choose whatever taxing source it wants to use. So we're using the tools that were given to us as local options and we've also uh, gotten a strong message from Olympia uh, in the conversations that, that we've had with them that should a transportation package come from the state that there may be other opportunities for less regressive and more progressive taxes that don't impact the low income and the poor and the seniors. And, and I, I agree, and I think that um, you know we 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 began um, to move a policy, and we passed it out of the house um, that ended up you know be becoming incorporated into la larger transportation revenue discussion. But we you know our our original approach to this was through a motor vehicle excise tax, which is a one-time tax. Um, and it is it is more progressive uh, because it's a it's an excise tax on on the value of your car. So you know different cars uh, cost different amounts. So as opposed to an annual uh, uh, fee. So you know I think there are different uh, funding mechanisms. None of us think um, that this is the most progressive one. I do think that the accommodations, the low fare, uh, the uh, uh, accommodation that's in this proposition is one way that we are offsetting the regressiveness of the sales tax and the license fee. So now we have time for any conclusion from uh, Council Member Haig or Representative Habib. Well, I welcome the opportunity to use technology through this webinar and uh, thank my colleagues, Representative Cyrus Habib for not only being here tonight, but being the collaborative, intelligent, and thoughtful representative of the people for the 48th District. And I thank our technical expert, Mr. John Risha, for being here and for bringing a wealth of information. Uh, I feel really pleased that we were able to connect with so many of you uh, about a very important issue and hopefully answer questions that uh, will lead you to a positive yes on April 22nd. And I'd like to thank Councilmember Haig for uh, representing me on the King County Council uh, long before I entered, entered into a legislative life and uh, very, very effectively and in a bipartisan and collaborative way for 
her entire time on the King County Council. And this is just another example of that, um, of that bipartisan and collaborative work. Um, and of course, Mr. Risha, uh, you know, county staff, like legislative staff, are the ones who make us look good. Um, they uh, have the facts, they educate us, um, and allow us to represent you better. Uh, at all levels of government. So I really appreciate your being here and working so hard uh, on, on this and other policy issues. Um, this is, uh, you know, when you talk to folks who take King County Metro, and we've talked primarily about Metro, um, but, you know, keep in mind uh, the really tangible and concrete improvements to, uh, to our, our roads as well. But when you talk to folks who take Metro, they are typically very, very happy with their commute especially since one bus away has come into existence and other technologies that allow you to coordinate and in a real-time fashion get to where you need to be to get on the bus you need to get on. Um, I would probably say as smartphones have made it easier for you to be productive on the bus, um, we certainly hope you're not using them when you're driving. Um, you know, as that's happened, um, I think uh, folks are more productive, happier, and, and enjoy the quality of life in this wonderful region of ours more. I'm proud of King County Metro, the efficiencies that they've brought to their system, the, the, the efficiencies that the executive and the council have brought, and I think it's an integral part of what makes this a great place to live and work, uh, and I, I urge you all to support this to make sure we do not go backwards, but instead are prepared just taking the first step in being prepared uh, for the tremendous economic and population growth I'm very excited to see here in King County. So thank you for uh, spending an hour with us this evening and listening to both of us speak. So let's keep King County moving now. Thank so you. thanks to everyone who participated in tonight's town hall. For more information, please visit movekingcountynow.org. You can also send a link to your friends to view this telewebinar uh, which is on your screen there on YouTube. And most importantly, don't forget to vote on April 22nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.